Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Bosel, the Associate Athletic Director for Marketing Promotions here at UMass Lowell. And thank you all for joining us for today's Riverhawk Insider and a conversation with Coach Norm Bazen as we await the start of our hockey season. Um, many of you have been very supportive here as we, we wait to get onto the ice, uh, whether it's through our cut, cutout campaign or through our United in Blue, United is One campaign. So, and we can't thank you enough for your continued support. Uh, the conversation today will be hosted by the voice of the River Hawks, Bob Ellis. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Bob and he can get us started with uh, Coach. Bob, take it away. Thank you very much, John. Good afternoon. Welcome. I am, as John Boswell uh, indicated, Bob Ellis. This is River Hawk Insider, a conversation with UMass Little Hockey head coach Norm Bazin. This get together made possible through the support of the Jean d'Arc Credit Union. As I'm fond of saying on hockey broadcasts, the Jean d'Arc Credit Union, we share a common thread. Coach Bazin is starting his 10th season leading the UMass Lowell hockey program. His teams have won three Hockey East tournament championships. Uh, they've been to the NCAA tournament five times. Uh, Norm's 637 winning percentage is fourth best among active coaches with at least 100 victories. Uh, as we talk today, uh, this country continues to battle a national health crisis College sports in many cases have been put on hold. All of our lives, I suspect, have undergone some sort of change. We hope this get together will help fill the void and keep you in touch with UMass Lowell Hockey. I hope as well that this high tech gathering finds everybody safe, healthy, and in good spirits. I will ask some questions, but the desire here is that this is really audience driven. I will note as we start the college hockey season, with starts and stops across the country is underway. The UMass Lowell Hockey Riverhawks, like many teams in Hockey East though, still waiting to get started. And I suppose that is as good a place as any to start this conversation. I say welcome to head coach Norm Bazin. I hope you had a terrific Thanksgiving. <clears throat> and I was wondering coach right off, if you could tell us simply at this moment, where are we and what's next? Well, first off, I'd like to welcome everybody to the call. It's um, it's exciting to uh, to get to see some of the familiar names, season ticket holders and uh, sponsors alike. Um, where are we at? At the moment, we're shut down. Uh, we had uh, one positive case uh, last Friday night uh, in anticipation of our uh, Saturday game. And uh, we're in a, a hold pattern to, uh, to let that... Uh, uh, go through our team and uh, at the moment it's uh, remained uh, as uh, one positive and we hope it remains that way. Right at the outset, a, a question from Charles Gold. He says, coach, in these crazy times, the younger generation shoulders an exceptional burden of not to be the one. It's got to be stressful to know that by doing almost everything right, you could still completely unknowingly bring home a virus that could hurt your team, grandparents, or parents. And he asks, what steps is the team taking to ensure that they're able to pull together during this crazy time and that players have mental health professionals available? Well, they're excellent question. I think uh, as far as um, mitigating the risk, we've taken great steps. Our administration's put us in a position to... Uh, to possibly have a season. So first and foremost, we're, uh, we'd like to thank them. And our medical staff has been great. They've given us uh, several um, protocols to, to put in place to, uh, to try to have a season. And so far we've masked for both practices and, and workouts. We have split groups for uh, video sessions. We have split groups for uh, strength and conditioning sessions. We've had uh, obviously uh, the hand washing and the masking are are uh, universal. Everybody's trying to practice those as much as possible. And, and we have a protocol in place in the facility itself where you come in one door and you, you go at the other and there's very uh, uh, little cross contamination. Now, when we get on the ice, we're still masking, but we do uh, bring the, the team together to practice. And uh, through all those mitigation practices, you're bound to get a positive at some point. So we're going through our first case and uh, that's where we're at. Another question that comes <clears throat> both from uh, Charles Gold, and, but also a similar question uh, submitted by uh, Jim Regan, says the CDC seems to be 
changing their quarantine protocols to be seven to 10 days after potential exposure. And they ask, do you plan to work to change the school protocol to align with this? Or so uh, in, do you envision it staying at 14 days throughout the season? No, that's an excellent question and, and, and great observations. Uh, this thing is ever changing. And, and as of yesterday, we went to a 10 day uh, quarantine versus 14. That was a welcome, uh, welcome surprise. And I think the uh, university and the healthcare professionals here on, on campus are adopting uh, the CDC's policies as they come forward. We're hoping it, uh, it's further eliminated uh, a few more days to, to seven. But right now it's at 10 and that's what we're following. So we've, uh, we're quickly making adjustments on the fly and we, we hope to continue to do so as, uh, as time goes. I mean, I'm curious, coach, does this also take a mental toll on the team in that guys want to play? They're trying to be safe in every way possible. I just kind of wonder if it's almost mentally exhausting at times. It certainly is, but it's not just for players. It's for coaches and uh, the general public alike, right? Everybody's looking forward to playing hockey. As the coaches, uh, I'm thrilled to do this uh, Zoom session with uh, all of you because it gives us something to, to, uh, to talk about, uh, more specifically hockey. Um, hopefully, we'll get to the hockey part here in a second after the COVID questions. But overall, everybody's anxious. You know, we're uh, fully... Uh, understanding of, of the severity of the pandemic, but we also want to uh, acknowledge that over 70,000 uh, uh, cases in American universities so far, and there's been uh, three hospitalizations and no deaths. So it's um, in this 18 to 24 age court, there's very, uh, there's very little uh, ramifications. And uh, as we progress with this thing, hopefully we'll get even more uh, understanding and, and maybe cut down the quarantine rules uh, further because uh, hockey's rules are a little different uh, than the SEC rules, than uh, the Big Ten rules. So we have to follow the guidelines that uh, are put forth by uh, Massachusetts, the university, the athletic department, and there's several layers, uh, NCAA and hockey's also. Now then, let's uh, tell you what, let's get to the hockey questions. And, and first off, just in general, you've been watching this team practice. I realize you haven't played a game yet, but as you watch this team practice, is there something that becomes apparent to you that you just absolutely love that excites you about this team and this season that lies ahead? Well, first and foremost, yeah, there are, there are several things. I, I like the leadership. I think it's been uh, so crucial in these COVID times to have uh, great communication amongst the team. We're all discovering new ways to communicate, Zoom being one of them. Um, we're forced to use it a few more times than we'd like, but it's just a state of affairs. Um, Lavex, Sodergren, and Kandata have done an excellent job of communicating uh, to the team. Uh, you know, we, we need the, those conduits to, to get uh, to, uh, to the team a lot of times, and they've done a, a marvelous job. You know, we returned four of our top five scores. I, I, I like the way several guys have, uh, have gone through camp. Before we broke uh, for this latest pause, um, I thought several guys had excellent camps and, and were, you know, probably playing some of their better hockey since they've been here. So I think of Andre Lee, who stood out. I think of newcomers like uh, Armstrong and Engham, who have stood out uh, in camp. I thought Sodergren and Levesque have had very good uh, scrimmages, as has uh, Baxter. And I think those guys initially stood out in some of the scrimmages. And as of late, I, I'm starting to see uh, Kanash, Sterrett, uh, Mian, Lada. Uh, certainly Welsh has stood out and done a good job. And Neaton's come back from uh, uh, a small setback to, uh, to have a good last two weeks. So uh, several guys have uh, been more visible as of late. And we're looking for more guys to come to the forefront. Now, you mentioned the goaltending in mentioning Henry Welch and Logan Neaton, and I want to jump to that because at least three different people, uh, uh, Nick Langerand, uh, Mark Cochran, and Jason Sicklick, in one way or another have submitted a question about goaltending. Uh, I'm going to start with Nick's question, which is a two-part question. He says, the largest question with this year's team is goaltending. That being said, two-part question regarding the matter. 
in your nine seasons so far, it's pretty much been a ride, uh, pretty much been ride the hot goalie mentality uh, with the exception of the Hernberg wall split. This year with Neaton and Welch being relatively inexperienced, could we see something on that mindset regarding the goaltender rotation? He says, secondly, uh, could that go to a three-man rotation once the RPI senior transfer uh, coming into the picture and becoming eligible for the second half of the year? I assume he refers to a fellow that I guess was in a newspaper report or on social media, but Norm, I'll let you handle that in whatever fashion you hope or would like. Yeah, I, I think that's the, uh, uh, it's a great question. It's a, a great observation. We, we will have a, a, a three horse race once, uh, you know, that transfer becomes eligible, but we'll wait till that's the case. Uh, overall, we're excited about uh, Logan Neaton. We're excited about uh, Henry. Uh, both guys are capable, have had great junior careers. So we're going to have to let them play and find out uh, what they're made of. And, and I think they're just anxious to get going also. I think there's no question that uh, we'll need to play some games to find out what's in net. But uh, the same questions were, uh, were apparent when Dougie Carr and, and, and Connor Hellbuck were here, when Kevin Boyle and Hernberg were here. Every year you'll have certain questions. But I think uh, what we're able to do here is create a lot of competition in every position. You know, whether you're talking about the forward position or the defense position, now we're going to have the same dogfight at the goalie position. And we've had excellent goalies here, and I'm really excited to give these kids an opportunity. I know you mentioned competition, and I talked last week with several players on this team via Zoom. And one thing they talked about with practices was how competitive uh, the practices are. I realize that practices to some extent are about learning systems and doing things such as that, but I get a feeling that you design practices so that they are, no matter whether we're talking about a forward, a defenseman, who's on the power play penalty killing, or whether it's the goaltender, you design practices to be competitive, um, to learn what people do in those sort of pressure situations. There's no question. I think it's a staple of our program to have depth and to use it. And if some guy's competing a lot harder than another, he'll find himself in hockey games. And I think uh, if you breed that type of culture, um, it's been success for us in the, uh, successful for us in the past. And you think of Gamble. Uh, you know, Gambert all started off as, uh, uh, I wouldn't say a marginal hockey player because he always had sense and, and work ethic, but he, he grew throughout his career. And he's one example uh, of a guy who continued to compete and it really had the, uh, the compete level that not too many other guys on the team had and he got better because of it. So um, it's a staple of our program. I welcome it. Um, I think practices are a lot harder than games when it's all said and done. And that's the way it should be because guys earn their time and the guys realize that uh, if they outcompete people in practice, uh, they will get some ice time. Uh, noting that that competition and the questioner, uh, Nick Langeran, had referred to the um, Hernberg and Tyler Wall splitting. Is it safe to say that that simply reflected how well both were playing in practice? And if it's uh, Neaton and Welch and they're both competing at a high level, they're both going to see the time. Yeah, and I can't I can't tell you exactly who's going to get uh, what number of games, but they're they're both going to get an opportunity. Everybody's here to play hockey, guys. And it, the exciting part is that we brought them here because we felt they had a, a certain level of skill to help our hockey club. And uh, both kids are very anxious. They're both great kids, and we look forward to uh, giving them that opportunity to compete. And, and that's all the people can ask when they get here. Uh, this question from Frank Thompson says. Uh, the team finished fourth in the preseason coaches poll. That's the Hockey East preseason coaches poll. He says, is this team being overlooked and underestimated? And I know you're not a big fan of polls, but your response, sir? Yeah, we'll know more when we start playing. I, I don't know if uh, fourth out of 11 teams is being overlooked or, or underestimated, uh, to be honest with you. I thought last year being picked seventh um, was – where we should have been picked and I think fourth is uh, is about where we should be picked I think uh, Boston College is uh, is a big favorite within the league just based on their level of talent but 
that's why you play the game. That's why hockey's so it's such an exciting game. It's uh, whichever team executes as a team um, triumphs uh, a lot of the nights. So we're looking forward to starting the season. I don't put much stock and I haven't thought much about the preseason polls and I never do, but um, overall um, I don't waste a lot of uh, mental energy th thinking about preseason polls or, or, or where we're picked. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Well, let me ask a question here. And talking about BC, you said they're picked up high because of their talent. So let me ask, is it talent that wins games or is it execution? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great question. We could spend hours talking about it. I, I think I'd like to think uh, based on our formula here at Lowell, it's the best team that wins games and uh, whoever plays and, and executes and it's on the same page that night and whoever competes hard enough. And um, you need some talent at the end of the day, somebody's going to put the puck in the net. But uh, I think when you push each other hard enough and you improve throughout a season, you've got a chance to be the best team at the end of the year. And that's, what's important. I'm not asking specifically about polls, but using them as an example here, um, hockey's coaches put us forth. That's their expectation. Uh, right now, the national polls, USCHO and uh, USA hockey have us at 10th in the nation. That reflects their expectations. When you go into a year coach, do you have a certain expectation? This is who we can be. This is what, we can accomplish? And if so, what are those expectations for this year? Yeah, that, that's an easy one, Bob. But my expectation is to maximize our potential. And once I get to figure out what our personnel is all about, um, I'll be in a better position to, to determine that within five or 10 games, given us a, a bigger, stronger sample size. But every year we want to maximize our potential and compete for championships. At the end of the year, we want to be the best team in the league. And uh, my expectation is everybody comes out to compete and improve every day. And where that takes us uh, will, uh, will depend on how we execute on, on a, you know, weekend to weekend, uh, week, week in, week out basis. Again, I do want to remind people that if you have questions, um, please enter them uh, via chat, to the chat screen, and I will get to them. I promise you that. I do want to really explore this hockey club, but I, a couple of things I wanted to bring up before doing so. One of them is simply the schedule. Uh, we play non-conference games, but they're against Hockey East teams. Um, this looks like, just looking at, at the quality of opponents, this looks like a very challenging schedule. Is that fair to say, you think? Yeah, it's fair to say. I think every team looks great, and, and you wonder as a coach, you look through the schedule and you wonder – uh, where are the wins going to come from? Because there's so much parity in the league and there's so many good teams, but I'm not worrying about that. I, you know, whether the Boston Bruins and the Pittsburgh Penguins are on the schedule, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the first few weekends, we just want to get to know who we are and, and, and what we have on our own team, because uh, you can try to evaluate guys in uh, flow drills and, and uh, seeing them in skill development sessions but you really don't know what you have until you get into the heat of a game and have to make a real time decisions and, um, and keep your composure in tough circumstances. So it, we're excited to play. And as you can tell, it's um, uh, the next five to 10 games will determine what type of group uh, we have. Oh, you mentioned that five to 10 games How, at what point in the season, and maybe you've kind of answered, but what point of the season do you know what you've got or to some extent, you almost experiment and test things almost up till the final weekend? Yeah, we do. I, I'm not dodging that question because it's an excellent question. Every year is a little different. You know, you want to find out what type of battle level your team has, if they can come back from deficits, if they can play with a lead, um, if they've got the right type of uh, team defense to, uh, uh, to get it done. So there's a lot of characteristics that develop over a season and uh, you know in this type of season it might uh, it might be the team that can stay the healthiest that will triumph in the end so it's that type of crazy season this question comes from Mark Cochran he says you mentioned Andre Lee looked good in practice do you have expectations that he can take his game to the next level and be a leader of this hockey team yeah, I think he can be one of the leaders. There's no question he's got the uh, the skill set to uh, uh, 
to take it up another notch from last season. Um, Berglund had an outstanding season last year. I'm, I'm looking for him to take another step. You know, there's also several guys that I thought had off years last year that I could, I, I have no doubt, can have outstanding seasons this year. And I think of Jerry Levesque first. I think of uh, Brian Chambers can take his game to another level. I think McDonald, Barton, uh, Blackman uh, are three guys that are going to lead our decor in many, many respects. And I, I think all three can take a step with their game. So that's why we're so excited to get this season started is I'd like to see some of these guys uh, take their game to the next level. And you, you can't uh, predict these things. You have to let the, the season evolve a little bit before you find out. A question here from John Caffarella. And forgive me, by the way, people, if I mispronounce names. Um, but anyway, the question uh, from John Caffarella says, is it going to be strange playing without a crowd uh, when you finally get to play? And, and I might also ask, is it going to be strange to coach in that situation? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something I can't answer until we actually go through it. But there's no question. Our, our home crowd, we've got one of the best crowds in the country. And sometimes they give you a lift in the third period when the, the team's down or the team's uh, flatlined a little bit and, and, and throw you over the edge. And we're going to miss that. Um, the cutouts, it's an interesting uh, facet out there. At least you can see that a lot of people care, and it's nice to see uh, a lot of people's faces, quite frankly. But um, everybody's going to be playing with the same challenge. So, um, you know, it's going to be one of those situations until you've gone through it, you miss the crowd noise a little bit, you miss the support uh, that you might see in certain faces and, and, and uh, that type of stuff. But Overall, you know, the game's played on the ice, so we're going to make the best of it. This question, and it's about one of the guys I like, and, and you were talking earlier about perseverance in a hockey career when you pointed to Joe Gambardella. One of his teammates, I think, also fits into that category. That's Dylan Zink. Uh, this question about Dylan Zink and his impact comes from Alan Baxter. He says, I noticed Dylan Zink was listed on the roster as the director of hockey operations. What does bringing back bringing an alum back in that role uh, do for the program and someone with Dylan's pro experience? Well, first and foremost, uh, you got me excited there seeing Dylan Zing back on the roster, but then, then I had to think he's hockey ops, not, uh, not our power play quarterback. No, it's, it's, uh, it's really exciting to have an alum come back and, and uh, share his experiences with the, the younger generation Dylan is someone that uh, has a great story. You know, you, you look at a kid who played 26 games his first year and had one assist, but ends up the top scoring defenseman in the history of the program the next three years. So he's been through the process. He, know, he knows what the daily grind can be. Uh, more importantly, he knows that um, there, there could be some great stories. I, I won't say that it's a Cinderella story, uh, Dylan's uh, hockey uh, history here, or, or, uh, but he, he achieved great things. He became an All-American from a guy who could basically not fit in the lineup to the guy who was counted upon to, uh, to lead our power play. And I think the last year he was here, we had a, a 26, 27% power play, be, mostly because of, uh, of him and Kapla. Uh, you know, uh, quarterback in that, uh, that thing. So it's great to, uh, to have Dylan aboard. He knows the process. He knows what these kids are going through, having lived it not too, uh, too long ago. So I think he's going to be a great asset to our coaching staff. Another question dealing with crowd from, uh, from Nick Langerand again, says uh, the crowd can be, I guess, a factor in the energy of the game shifting. Uh, do you feel that not having that being a factor uh, and does that factor make your job either easier or more difficult uh, as far as noise factors concerned? I think I didn't foul that up. No, it's, uh, it's a great observation. I'll have to s sit and wait, but it's going to be a challenge for not just the coaching staff and the head coach. It's going to be a, a factor and a challenge for the whole team. We're going to have to create our own energy. And, you know, we've been a great road team in the last four or five years. Uh, several of those years we've been in the top three or four in the nation as far as road wins. And you have to create your own atmosphere, your own energy on the road. And we're going to have to do that at home as well as on the road. So I think that's uh, it's another additional challenge that we're going to have to face this year, but everybody's going to be going through it. So I think from that standpoint, it, uh, 
evens it out a great deal. I don't know if you have the answer to this or somebody else on the technical side would know, but Jim Capuza writes and asks, uh, will the Songus crew be able to produce audio like a crowd? Um, do we know if there will be any energy created through the sound system at the Songus Center? Are you asking me, Bob? Or are you asking? Uh, I'm asking anybody who Bob. might know the answer. Yeah, I, I think uh, we did ask about that uh, some time ago, and and, and uh, John Boswell might be in a better position to answer that question. I think they're going to pipe some some crowd noise of some kind uh, in that, uh, but I can let him answer. Come on, John, step right up. So yeah, to, to answer that question, we do have a few uh, sound clips and background noise. Um, you know, we're going to mix and match and test it out as we go. Some of the things will be great, some won't. And, uh, you know, it's all about being able to create whatever home atmosphere we can for the team on the ice. So if there's something that the team likes, then we're going to keep going with it. If something the team says, cut that out, we're going to pull the plug right away. Um, but uh, you better believe that goal horn will, uh, will be locked and loaded, ready to go. And I'm sure it will uh, scare a few people with the uh, the vibrations off the empty seats. We will look forward to that. Hopefully we'll use the goal horn a great deal. Uh, that said, a couple questions here from Tom Poirier says, uh, do you have, and I don't know if these are things you can answer yet, Norm, but do we have an emerging starting goalie at this point, he asks. And then he also asks, do we have any injured players on the roster at this time? And I don't know if you want to give away those sorts of secrets, but I figured I'd ask the questions. No, they're good questions. Uh, the first answer, no, there's no starting goalie until they get a chance to play games and, and show me what they have in a game. Uh, the, the second question, um, you know, from, from my standpoint, we're just going to let the, uh, the start to the season happen before we make too many assumptions on, uh, uh, on playing time for certain people who's to emerge and all that kind of stuff. So I, uh, you know, much like yourself, we're going to use the words unfit to play, whether somebody's injured or has COVID. You know, those are the new words. That's how the NHL termed it. And I, uh, I'm going to steal that from the National Hockey League. Unfit to play is the only thing we're going to tell Bob and his media courts, whether somebody's uh, out for two weeks or they're out for two days, it's unfit to play. Which I could wear that title well as well, Dorb. Uh, this question from uh, Jillian Quigley. Uh, she says, with the team on pause, where does that leave the student athletes? Are they isolated? Can they work out? What is their mindset? Yeah, that, that's a uh, multifaceted question because some can work out, some are isolated. So if, if someone's got COVID, they're not supposed to be working out and uh, they're isolated to their room and they're brought meals and, uh, and that type of thing. Some people who are quarantining are allowed to ride the bike and we bring them various uh, sports equipment so they can work out of their homes, but they're not allowed to come to the facility and they have to do what they can do at home, which is very limited, as you can tell. So it's, uh, there's a whole lot of protocols that we could spend an hour talking about and they're very uh, complicated, but sometimes uh, they change and they changed uh, you know, two days ago when they went from 14 day quarantine to a 10 day. So we're hoping it changes again to a seven day quarantine so we can inch closer to uh, playing more games and having less delays. Uh, earlier, people had asked about the goaltending, and I think back to quotes I hear from goaltenders after terrific nights where they give all the credit to the team in front of them, uh, to the defense and two forwards coming back. And I realize goaltending or goals for and against are not necessarily about either goal scorers or goaltenders. Um, but I've heard a great deal of compliments over the years for this team's defense. I look at the uh, defensemen we have on the roster. Uh, there is just one senior but yet it feels like a very talented veteran squad. I've got to think that you have got to love this defense group that you've assembled. Yeah, we like the personalities. We like the, uh, the bodies, you know, we're waiting to see how this year's defensive core competes. And, uh, but yes, I mean, last two years, you've been looking at a few freshmen, as many as four or five freshmen in the lineup, as many as four or five sophomore in the lineup, it stands to reason that as juniors, they should be better than they were as freshmen and sophomores, but I'm not going to give them that credit yet. We're going to let the, the, uh, the game start to find out if they've got the same battle level as they did when they were freshmen and sophomores. 
Uh, it also stands to reason that a couple of freshmen will be pushing for ice time. And our senior Baxter is going to be, uh, you know, he's shown some great promise in the practice. It's probably the best I've seen Baxter practice since he's been here. So all those things put together, you should have a good decor, but let's let, uh, let them see it, if they can prove it here in games. Fair enough. Um, this question comes from Todd Jenkins says, have you, have you had an opportunity to watch any of the hockey East games that have been played? Um, are there opponents, I guess are, well, anyway, uh, are there opponents um, we should be looking out for as fans? Yeah, all, uh, all 10 other teams in hockey East, but I've only got a chance to see um, uh, UMass and Boston College are the only games I've seen thus far. And uh, there's been so such limited games on TV. They both look like excellent teams. They both competed very hard. It was a good hockey game. And uh, until we start playing, I, I think uh, Boston College from top to bottom, even though they're missing one of their better players, Newhook, to uh, the Canadian World Junior Team, they're, uh, they're one of the more talented teams, no question. So it's exciting to play against good teams. So... Um, I welcome the, the best into Songus and, and we want to go play against the best teams because that's what you have to face if you're going to make the national tournament at the end of the year. I mean, I'm curious, since you mentioned watching games, as I suppose the rest of us have, um, just watching what television presents. When you watch a game on TV, do you just watch it as a spectator, as a fan, or do you watch it as a coach trying to dissect what everybody else is doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a valid question because uh, when I watch the National Hockey League, I'm able to just watch as a fan and enjoy the game. But when you you watch Hockey East, it seems you revert back to seeing what they've changed from last year because you're constantly trying to dissect the opponent in different ways. So, um, you know, I, I would say it's, um, it's twofold. When I watch another league or another level altogether, I'm just watching as a general fan trying to be entertained. When I'm watching Hockey East games, you're really seeing what they might have changed from the previous year so you can play them to the best of your ability when you do get a chance to play them. Shifting gears here a little bit back to the question of COVID-19. This is from Henry. I'm not sure Henry's last name, but Henry writes and says, do you have access to the instant COVID-19 tests or do you have to wait three days to a week for results? Well, it's, uh, it's a good question. I, I've, I know way too much about the testing from all the research we did this summer and the time we spent doing it. We use PCR tests and those are the most accurate tests. Uh, it's a nasal swab and our administration has put us in a great position to get the results fairly quickly. And uh, we use something called the Broad Institute out of Boston and uh, the people administering the tests on campus have done an incredible job of getting uh, the results uh, fairly quickly. So within 24 hours, we usually get results from our tests. New this year in Hockey East is overtime and the potential for a shootout. Not that overtime itself is new, but three on three overtime. And Eric Allen asks, he says, can you explain the new overtime format? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because it's, uh, it's something we had to get educated on. And all of us have seen some NHL games and, and seen the excitement in overtime at that level. So they're trying to uh, mimic some of that excitement. Uh, so after a 60-minute game is, is complete, um, teams uh, are shifted to three-on-three three for a five-minute uh, overtime. So instead of a five-on-five five overtime like it was last season, it's going to be three on three. If the game remains tied at the end of those five minutes uh, with three on three, you're going to go to a shootout. And, um, you know, so it's exciting. The point system is a little bit more complicated, but, um, you know, if you're tied at the end of the three on three overtime, each team uh, receives one point and the shootout will determine the second uh, point but it will not go towards the NCAA. The, the game will uh, officially be ruled a tie. So that's the, where the confusion may come with some uh, season ticket holders. And, and I guess, and, and John Boswell had asked as well, kind of holding my feet to the fire, trying to get into an explanation of how the standings work. I know that <clears throat> some of our hockey East opponent, when we play some opponents this year, their conference games, some of them 
some of them are non-conference games. I know in some of the games that have taken place, um, they have played the shootout even though they were non-conference games. Am I correct in the understanding that that is just in case, for whatever reasons, they never get the conference games in, those non-conference games would then become conference games? Yeah, you're correct. Um, you know, this is a moving target. Everybody knows uh, what we're uh, going through right now, whether you're an athlete, a non-athlete, whether you're a college student or, or, or associate with any university. We're all going through this pandemic and, it, and none of us can predict what's going to go on in the next two or three or four or five months. In any case, so people are playing non-conference games for the time being. They're called provisional non-conference games, which means if we need to count some of those non-conference games uh, towards league play, we will do so. But for now, they're non-conference games against league opponents. And it's, uh, I think, I don't know of another coach in Hockey East. Anyway, we have a weekly call and none of us are concerned about who we play that week. We just want to play. Um, one other the last thing I'll ask about the standings, because I think we're attempting to play 20 conference games that may not happen for everybody if we end up with an uneven number of games is placement in the standings determined by points or let's say by winning percentage or percentage of points won yeah it's an excellent question It'd be a better question for the commissioner because i haven't got too wrapped up in in any of that but my understanding is um, you need 13 games to qualify for the national tournament at the end of the year even though none of us are getting wrapped up in that at the moment, we're just trying to have a season. Um, the league games is a 20 game season at the moment. We'll see how many games we can uh, get through in any event. Uh, at the end of the day, if someone fell short, I'm sure he would take winning percentage as one of the criteria, whether it's the only criteria remains to be seen. All right. Uh, moving on. The last thing I want to say about overtime, while well, we got you to explain all the rules on how it works and shoot out how it works. I'm just curious, do you like the change? Do you like the idea of three-on-three -three, uh, overtime? Uh, that's a great question. I uh, I think it's a it's a drastic change, but there's no question uh, for fans out there that it's very exciting. You know, you're going to see breakaways. You're going to see odd man situations. You're going to see there's a whole lot of open ice. And uh, it's a very exciting product for the fans, uh, for coaches, you know, if my hair is not all gray yet, it probably will be uh, because, you know, there's a lot of situations that present, present themselves uh, over the course of a three on three, five minute overtime that uh, you'd rather not see. But um, overall, if it's exciting for the fans, it's probably a good thing for hockey coaches. That's a whole other issue. Um, we talked a little, we talked earlier about the goaltending. I prodded you about the defense core. Um, talk to me about the offense. And I realized uh, at least in the UMass Lowell approach, it's not about the three forwards. It's about a five-man offense. Um, do you like the offense? Do you feel that the offensive depth is there? Yeah, I think the depth is there. I mean, do I like the offense? Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about the offense, the defense, and the goaltending. However, you know, we're kind of let these guys compete, let these guys um, – play some games before I get too excited about anyone, to be honest with you. Um, Berglund, uh, Brown, those Andre Lee, those are returning guys that we know. We have a little bit more of a confidence level. I think Wells, Chambers, Kaiser are guys that, you know, can make a, a big step and, and be more of a factor. I think young guys like Allen, you know, want to steal some minutes right away and, and can Ash and stare it. So there's several guys that, uh, want to, uh, to insert themselves in the lineup and, and play a vital role. And that's how it should be. It's exciting for, uh, for the game. There's no question when you think of Sodegra and Levesque, they've proven themselves over their three years, but they also can make uh, more of a dent in the offense as they get going here in their senior year. Shifting gears uh, completely, uh, a question about uniform numbers. This comes from Nick Langerand. Uh, he says, um, regarding jersey numbers, with this program, I've noticed this team has not had a number above 37. That, of course, was worn by Connor Hellebuck. Um, is there a reason why you don't allow your players to select higher numbers? I will also, before letting Norm answer, note that Ed McGrain wore 39 and Ron Hainsey wore 77. 
but I'm just curious, uh, Norm, your reaction to numbers and do you have any rules? Yeah, it's, it's uh, first of all, we're lucky to have you, Bob, because uh, I remembered Hainsey, but I didn't remember uh, McGrain that well. But yeah, I, I don't have a problem with large, you know, high numbers. If someone were to ask me, they want to wear uh, 39 or 77, I, I necessarily wouldn't have a problem with it. And uh, so I've never uh, had a rule, a hard and fast rule that somebody can't wear a, a high number. And we may see it in the future now that they heard this. Now, as, as I recall, you wore number 19. Um, how did you pick that number? Had, was this something you wore throughout your youth hockey career and on toward college? Although I think you did first appear with a higher number as a freshman, but uh, let's stick with the, the question of 19. Yeah, I wore anything with a nine in it. So growing up, I wore nine and, you know, whatever had a nine in, in it, uh, the closest thing I would wear. So it's, I was fortunate enough to get 19 after my freshman year, I believe. And that's why I like that number. But, you know, it's a, it's personal preference. A lot of guys um, are wearing crazy numbers at the youth level. And I think it's great. It's exciting to have uh, uh, a little uh, individualism from a standpoint of you see guys wearing goalie numbers. You see goalies wearing forward numbers now. It's all kinds of stuff. So I think there's a goalie in the National Hockey League where 17 or some crazy number. And Hellebuck made 37 pretty popular here also. you you got to be proud as you've watched his career uh, progress, but not only that, we, we talked earlier about goaltenders, and I remember hearing, I think one of the Nashville radio announcers at one point referring to UMass Lowell as the goalie factory. Um, you've got to be proud seeing the Hellebox and Boyles and, and the various goaltenders, including uh, your former college roommate and the sorts of careers that they've had. Oh, no question. You know, there's nothing that gives me more pride than watching an NHL game and, and watching, uh, you know, when Roley played, Rollison be successful, now Hellebuck be successful, sending him a text after the game um, and just congratulating him on whatever they did well. Uh, Hutton, I did not coach, but I couldn't be happier for him. He's such a quality person. There's so many guys that you're excited for, Rudel, uh, Boyle, you name it. It's, um, it's part of the, uh, the enjoyment, the hidden bonus of the job when you see those guys go, go out and, and do so well and, and succeed in life. I know we're at a point where we should wrap this up. So I guess the last thing I'll ask, and this has kind of been my a standard question over the years that I've asked players how they interpret it. I've heard you at times refer to classic Lowell style hockey. And I like asking players, especially the younger players who are new to the program, I like asking them how they define Lowell style hockey. So I guess since we're getting near the start of a season, Norm, let me ask you, how do you define Lowell style hockey? hockey well well for me it's uh it's uh, a culture of competitiveness it's uh it's hard it's fast it's discipline it's a type of hockey that uh, uh usually excels in the end and we let a lot of guys make uh, make mistakes early to, to learn from them and um, hopefully we have the type of team we want by the end of the season and it's exciting to uh, to see how our group comes together and during these crazy COVID times, it's, uh, it's thrown a whole new importance in, in team. And even though you might not be uh, together all the time with social distancing within the locker rooms, et cetera, uh, the guys are probably closer than ever as a family to, to make sure they depend on each other for communication and, uh, and for health and safety reasons. So um, that's why we're so anxious for the season to start. And I'm sure as many coaches are uh, all over the country. Norman, coach, I thank you very much for your time. I also thank everybody that has joined us as part of this audience and people that have submitted questions. Um, it, it never should be just me talking to the head coach. And you've made it possible that I've had to say uh, very little. And I appreciate uh, all the input from the audience. So Norm, I thank you. Audience, I thank you. Um, we, I suspect you're going to be doing this on some sort of semi-regular basis, but because I'm not behind the scenes, I will turn it over to John Boswell and, and see if I've missed anything. I do want to thank the Jean d'Arc Credit Union, again, for their support making these sorts of events possible. While the Jean d'Arc Credit Union, we share a common thread. John? Bob, it's tough to end after a perfect ending like that, but thank you to both yourself and Norm and, and to everyone who participated with questions today. 
as Bob mentioned, our goal is to have this as a semi-regular feature um, as an insight into what the next week's opponent might be. Um, so do keep an eye on those as we go forward. We want to keep you engaged as our most loyal supporters. And uh, if you can't be here in person, you're more than welcome to join us in the cutout crowd at uh, goriverhawks.com backslash cutouts. Until next time, Bob, Norm, thank you both. We'll see you on the ice.